and welcome to the West Asia Post with me, Radhi Francis. This is our weekly show where we bring you all the latest updates from the world's most volatile region. The last one month was a dream for football fans. The Euros and Copa America kept the football fever live and kicking. But now all eyes are on the 2022 FIFA World Cup. With less than 500 days to go, Qatar is gearing up for football's biggest festival. But the death of migrant workers in the country have raised concerns. Reports suggest over 6,500 workers have died in Qatar ever since the country was awarded the contract. Qatar, however, has vehemently denied any allegations of abuse. But the question remains, will these deaths taint the legacy of football? Gigantic, futuristic, and rising out of the desert. These stadiums are impossible to miss. Everywhere you turn in Qatar, there is a new one. Qatar is preparing for football's biggest festival. The 2022 FIFA World Cup. Less than 500 days from now, these stadiums will be packed with frenzied fans, screaming at the top of their voices. It is the first World Cup to be held in West Asia. The biggest event to take place in the Arab world, and Qatar is leaving no stones unturned. It is using the tournament to showcase its rise, from a small pearl diving enclave to a gulf metropolis. We've been preparing to host this tournament for the last 10 years. Most of the stadiums are ready. The remaining three stadiums will be ready by the end of the year. We will use six of the stadiums for the 2021 FIFA Arab Cup. The infrastructure of the state is ready too. The metro is ready to run on three lines during the tournament. The road network is 90% ready at the moment and will be ready to serve fans in 2022. Since 2010, Qatar is on a construction spree. Seven new stadiums, hundreds of new hotels, public transport systems, new airports and even a new city to host the final. The total bill is pegged at over $300 billion. But what is missing is the human cost. Each of these structures were built by an army of workers. Many of whom hail from South Asian nations. Since clinching the hosting rights, 6,500 of them have died in the Gulf nation. This means that ever since December 2010, an average of 12 workers have died every week in Qatar. The damning figures came out in a new report by The Guardian. A majority of these workers were from India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Most of them work in dangerous conditions. They are involved in low-wage labor, often in scorching heat and without safety measures. Their living conditions, too, are appalling. Their passports often cease to entrap them. The deaths were attributed to a number of reasons. Multiple blunt injuries from falling, asphyxiation and what Qatar calls natural causes. This means that the workers could have died from causes like respiratory or heart failure, but they are seldom backed by an autopsy, making it very hard to verify. Qatar's hotels have also been accused of abusing migrant workers through intimidation. They are paid on the basis of their nationality, and many are afraid to leave their jobs. The Gulf nation has hit back at the allegations, calling them sensationalist and outrageous. This is not the first time Qatar has been pulled up for this, but it says that it is reforming the system. It does not deny the stadium-related deaths, but says the number is not in the thousands. Qatar says that there has been three work-related deaths and 35 which were not related to work. 
On the World Cup uh, sites, we've, we've had, unfortunately, three work-related deaths, which are, and the work, definition of work-related death is death occurring on the construction sites. Qatar is not new to human rights violations. It's an absolute monarchy with freedoms in check. But the FIFA, which claims to protect human rights across football, seems to have turned a blind eye to this. FIFA says the frequency of accidents at their construction sites is far lower than any other projects. There is no data to confirm this, but their lack of concern is unsettling. Football is a multi-billion dollar industry. Outside stadiums, IT holds immense power. And with that power comes immense responsibility. But away from screaming fans and world-class players, it remains complicit in human rights violations, earning profits on the graves of thousands. Qatar 2022 is not the first World Cup engulfed in controversy. Records suggest it will not be the last one, as fans throng the stadiums for football's biggest festival. Will the deaths of migrants taint the legacy of the World Cup? West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. Like always, we will continue to bring you all the latest updates from the heart of the conflict. We have a lot of stories lined up for you. But first, as usual, let's take a look at what else is making the headlines across West Asia. Iraq Shiite cleric Muqtada Sadr has said that he won't take part in the October elections. One of the most influential figures in Iraq. Sadr led a political bloc that emerged as the biggest in the 2018 elections. Iran's president Hassan Rouhani has said that they could enrich uranium up to 90% purity. However, Rouhani said that the country is still seeking a revival of the 2015 nuclear deal. This remark is his second such public comment this year about 90% enrichment, a level suitable for a nuclear bomb. The Turkish president marked the anniversary of crushed military coup with a series of events commemorating victims who died trying to quash the uprising. In 2016, 251 people were killed resisting rogue military units in the attempted overthrow of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Lebanon's Prime Minister-designate Saad Hariri stepped down, saying that he was unable to form a government. Hariri's resignation comes nine months after he took up the challenge to form government. Lebanon is currently reeling from an economic and political crisis that has threatened stability in the West Asian nation. Four Iranian intelligence officials have been charged with plotting to kidnap an American journalist. The intended target was Iranian-American Masih Halinjad, who has been critical of the country's laws. Iran's foreign ministry has dismissed the allegations as baseless and ridiculous. A fire in a coronavirus ward unit killed over 90 people in Iraq. This is Iraq's second such tragedy in three months. Anger is mounting in the country and grieving families are calling for action. While the political establishment is blaming corruption, can Iraq's healthcare system cope up with another tragedy? For the citizens of Iraq, it was like reliving a nightmare. Another coronavirus hospital on fire. Several victims killed and hundreds wounded. And a political establishment that shifts blame. Grief and anger gripped the Iraqi city of Nasiriya after fire swept through a COVID isolation unit. The devastating blaze erupted in the Al Hussein hospital. 
fueled by the explosion of oxygen canisters. The front door was burning and the back door was closed, so people couldn't get out. But before the fire broke out, some of them managed to get out and afterwards people were stuck inside, and the ceiling fell on them. We managed to take out some people, but they were suffering and the rest of them burned and died. An investigation has revealed how the fire began. Sparks from the faulty wiring spread to an oxygen tank which then exploded, engulfing the entire unit. What was left were charred remains and grieving families. Four members of my family died. Two of my cousins and my uncle and his wife died here, in addition to two of my neighbors who died in the same way yesterday. I don't know whether to console my family, my neighbors or my relatives. What can I say? In Nasiriyah, the scenes were tragic. Anguished relatives looking for traces of their loved ones. Mourners weeping and praying over coffins. Protesters blaming government officials. And medics lamenting the lack of basic safety measures. At the city's morgue, anger mounted among families, waiting to receive the bodies of their relatives. As the first of the funerals were held, several protesters gathered to vent their anger. A patient infected with the coronavirus is brought here to be treated, but is returned in a coffin along with his family and children. Where would such a thing happen? Many mourners cried openly. Their tears tinged with anger. They blamed both the provincial government of Dikar and the federal government in Baghdad for mismanagement. Prime Minister Mustafa al Kadimi chaired an emergency meeting, suspending and arresting several officials. This is Iraq's second such tragedy in three months. In April, a similar explosion killed at least 82 people wounding several others at a Baghdad hospital. The country's president has blamed corruption for both. For many, it was an accident in the making. The hospital lacked a fire sprinkler system or even a simple fire alarm. A grim reflection of Iraq's health care system, crippled by war and sanctions. West Asia Bureau, we on. World is one. First came the normalization deal, then came the opening of new embassies, and now there's a new outreach by Israel. Something is brewing in West Asia, and at the heart of that is Israel. From Jordan to Turkey, there has been a thaw of ties. But what does this mean for the region? We tell you more. Something is brewing in West Asia. At the heart of this, is one country, Israel. The Jewish state is ringing in a new political era, and it looks like it's in the mood to amend some ties. All of this started with a meeting. Yair Lapid met his Jordanian counterpart. In focus was the water crisis in Jordan. Israel and Jordan agreed to a water deal an unprecedented one with double the water supply to help Amman fight the drought. Water resources have been a core issue of cooperation between Israel and Jordan since 1994, but over the last few years, the relations have deteriorated. But what was even more important was another meeting. This one, however, was meant to be a secret. Reports say that Israeli Prime Minister Bennett met with Jordan's King Abdullah, a hush-hush meeting that took place in Amman's royal palace. But why the secrecy if there has been a peace agreement since 1994? Netanyahu's term was marked by strained relations with Jordan. Israel crossed a few red lines and it did not consult its neighbor. But this government is prioritizing Jordan. It understands the importance Amman plays in the region and has chosen amicable ties over clashing interests. 
But this is not just Jordan. Israel is reaching out too. It wants to improve ties with everyone. And it looks like Turkey could be more than willing. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan called Israel's new president, congratulating him on taking office. This is the same Erdogan that once called Israel a terrorist state. So what has changed now? A new government heading the Jewish state, or Erdogan's own tanking economy. It looks like it could be both. Erdogan could not see eye to eye with Netanyahu. And with Bibi no longer in the Prime Minister's seat, things are looking up for Naftali Bennett. As for economic interests, trade and tourism between the two countries could be crucial for Turkey's economic interests. Secret and open meetings, dozens of phone calls and a push to rebuild ties, something is brewing here in the region. But what exactly are the talks about? This historic agreement must be extended to other nations and countries seeking peace with Israel. We are a nation of peace and those who are interested in peace with us will be welcomed with open arms. In focus are the Abraham Accords, the normalization deal brokered by the United States that were pegged as the dawn of a new era in West Asia. But it is no longer Netanyahu's best friend who is calling the shots in the White House. Biden calls Israel America's greatest friend, but it also pushes for a two-state solution. Reports suggest the administration would like to see trust-building steps between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Both Jordan and Israel are flying to Washington soon, not on the same planes, but maybe with the same agenda. Could this be the push for new normalization agreements? Only time will tell, but for now, it looks like the phones won't stop ringing in Israel. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. This year, it is another pandemic era Hajj for Muslims across the world, but it is not without historic changes. This time, the pilgrimage will be limited to 60,000 vaccinated citizens and residents of Saudi Arabia. With Saudis staring at religious reset, women too are allowed to register without their guardians. This week, we take a look at how this another pandemic era Hajj will look. The Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam. For Muslims across the world, it is a secret pilgrimage. A once-in-a-lifetime duty for all able-bodied Muslims to perform. If they can afford to perform the annual pilgrimage. Before the coronavirus pandemic, millions of Muslims would undertake the Hajj every year. On an average, 2.5 million pilgrims would descend on Mecca, taking part in the five-day-long rituals. But since 2020, it is a very different Hajj. There are restrictions on the numbers of pilgrims. There are restrictions on foreigners entering the kingdom. And social distancing is a must for all. This year, it is another downsized Hajj. Only 60,000 vaccinated pilgrims are allowed. All of them are citizens of Saudi Arabia. They are chosen through an online vetting system. The event is confined to those aged 18 to 65 and without any chronic illnesses. Muslims from within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia of all nationalities have the opportunity to perform hard this year. And here we stress that arrangements for this were based on the Kingdom's constant keenness on the pilgrims' health and the safety of their countries. Overseas Muslim pilgrims have been part for a second straight year in the Kingdom. Riyadh seeks to repeat last year's success that saw no virus outbreak during the five-day Hajj. Aside from strict social distancing measures, a smart Hajj card has been introduced. It allows contact-free access to camps and hotels 
allows buses to ferry pilgrims around religious sites and also helps track down any missing pilgrims. Of course, this year's pilgrimage is completely different and exceptional. No pilgrim can access the holy sites except through the four reception centers assigned by the ministry. Also, pilgrims cannot enter any camp except through the smart gate. The ministry has issued smart cards. Authorities have deployed black and white robots, seen dispensing bottles of sacred water from the Zamzam Spring in Mecca's Grand Mosque. It's a move to avoid as much contact as possible. The goal of the smart robot is to apply self-service without any contact between people. And this is one of the services given by the presidency for the affairs of the two holy mosques. For the women, this is a historic Hajj. Women in the kingdom can now register for the pilgrimage. Without a male guardian, this comes as Saudi Arabia stares at a religious reset in line with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's 2030 vision. The Hajj this year was also marked by the first ever female-led security briefing. It was presented by Saudi soldier Abir Al Rashid, who unveiled the traffic and security plans for the pilgrimage. Last year, the Hajj went ahead on the smallest scale in modern history. This year, the kingdom has increased the numbers, but barring foreign pilgrims has caused resentment. Hosting the Hajj is a matter of prestige for Saudi rulers. They are the custodians of Islam's holiest sites. For them, it is their most powerful source of political legitimacy. But with frustration growing across the Muslim world, is a downsized Hajj detrimental for the kingdom and its religious soft power? West Asia Bureau, Vion, World is One. Palestinian territories do not have an airport, but this didn't stop these two brothers from buying a plane. It is a different kind of take-up for the Sayrafi brothers, who are turning this Boeing 707 into a restaurant in the West Bank. We bring you their story. In the West Bank, this Boeing 707 is ready. Final touches are being added. Workers are making sure it is prepared for takeoff. A new kind of takeoff as a restaurant. It is an initiative by two Palestinian twin brothers, an aviation-themed eatery in an isolated mountain area near Nablus, decorated with Palestinian and Jordanian flags. We will create on the plane a high-level restaurant and coffee shop, but we do not have enough time before Eid al-Adha to complete the work. So we will start work by providing fast food and hookahs. Inside the old jet's cabin, seats have been stripped out. The window panes have been removed and tables will be soon fitted in the fuselage, which has been painted white with laminate wooden floors. The brothers purchased the plane in 1999. They even paid an Israeli company $20,000 to move the jet to the West Bank. The 13-hour transport required key roads to be closed, coordinated by both Israeli and Palestinian sides. We brought the plane on July 30, 1999, and because of the circumstances that occurred and the political situation, on 28 September 2000, when the Intifada uprising began in the West Bank and Gaza, this led to the closure of all roads and the project to convert the plane was placed on hold until now. The plane was a big deal for Palestinians. There is still no airport in the Palestinian territories. Those who wish to fly abroad usually fly via Jordan. For the Serafi brothers, the plane is not just about a restaurant. It is also about the dreams of many Palestinians. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. That's all we have for you on this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week with a brand new lineup, bringing you more stories from the world's most volatile region. Until then, stay home and stay safe. I am Ghadi Francis and you're watching We On. World is One.